We know that the human, UN Human Rights Group are meeting about this. They, they really see this, these protests as being at a critical point, but what influence do they have in this situation? Well, I think, Bev, we have to be honest here that the influence is largely symbolic in that you wouldn't expect the Iranian regime to listen to any type of uh, criticism that comes out of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Uh, they'll just simply argue that it's politically motivated, the UN is a tool of the West, et cetera. But what it does is it does provide to those people who are protesting in Iran a sign that the international community is watching, that they are cognizant of the reasons why the protests have developed over women's rights, over the death of women in police custody, notably Nasa Amini, and the death of protesters uh, who have been killed by security forces. And that's important because this crackdown by the regime has been brutal at times. It has killed more than 400 people, including more than 50 children, yet the protest will not stop. Uh, they, they will not be denied, as it were. So you can expect this to go on for some weeks and even months. Yeah. What do you feel, having seen protests like this before, is different about this movement? Well, in 2009, we did see millions of Iranians take to the streets after the disputed presidential election, believing that it had been rigged uh, in favor of the Supreme Leader's favorite, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. In that case, the regime was able to eventually put down the protest by decapitating it, by detaining uh, the leaders of the Green Movement. Uh, for example, Mir Hussein Mousavi and his wife, Zara Ranavart, who are still in house arrest after 11 and a half years. This time, the regime is finding it more difficult to stem the protest across the country, all across the country, because it really doesn't have leaders. It doesn't have a single political figure that you can just put away and try to take the steam out of the demonstrations by saying, well, look, who will take you to the streets now? It was women who went to the streets of Iran and young people who've gone to the streets of Iran. And increasingly, it's been, for example, people in different areas of the Iranian economy, workers from automobile manufacturing to the oil industry with their own economic and social concerns. So with those decentralized protests, the regime is really scrambling to find a way to close this off. Mm. And when you kind of see the public defiance of the Iranian soccer team, of, of popular actresses and, and influential people within Iran, there's a defiance that we haven't seen before. It's a, it, it, there's a sense is that they don't feel they have anything to lose at this point. It's a sign that they are willing to stand up to the threat of arrest, the threat of detention, the threat of losing their careers, uh, at the very least. And that, again, changes the narrative from 2009, because in 2009, the regime could say two things. One is it says, well, look, these are really only protests in northern Tehran. These are really only the privileged elite up there who have their own you know, little position that doesn't represent the country. And then the regime would also say, as it's doing this time, these are foreign instigated protests. It's the US, it's Europe, it's countries like Australia. They're stirring up trouble here. The more you have Iranians who may be athletes, who may be filmmakers, who may be educators, who may be lawyers who stand up from within Iran and say, no, th this is me. This is not Uncle Sam talking. This is not Europe talking. This is me. This is not a privileged elite. This is me. The more it undercuts the regime's legitimacy, in trying to say, you know, we are the real victims here and not the demonstrators. Yeah. Give me an idea of what you think could give the regime a way of, of making some concessions, concessions, changing tack a little. I mean, Bev, there's a forward way to do this, and I hesitate to say this as an outsider, but if you look at it, if you listen to the grievances that start with women's rights, that start with their political and social space, including compulsory hijab, then that would be an important step. If you listen to their grievances about how women and others have been treated in police custody, because it was the death of Masa Amini after she was reportedly beaten by morality police that started this, that is a step forward. If you release some of those who have been detained and held, including foreign nationals in recent weeks, that's a step forward. 
but all of these steps are limited. In other words, the path to listening and dialogue is limited because the regime is divided. Mm -hmm. You do have some within the regime who think, look, we have really got to start trying to find some middle ground here. But you have others, especially in the Supreme Leader's office, who think that even discussing these requests of the protesters for social and political rights, that this would show weakness. And Iran, which of course is embroiled in nuclear talks with the international community, which is involved in rivalries throughout the region with other countries like Saudi Arabia and Israel, this regime, or at least the Supreme Leader, never wants to talk because that might be weakness. Yeah. Let's just switch to Turkey's president, another man who doesn't like to portray any weakness. What do, what do we make of the renewed military operations and the threat to expand them? Well, unlike the Supreme Leader of Iran, uh, Turkey's president, Recep uh, Tayyip Erdogan, does have to be re-elected in 2023. Mm -hmm. And one way to make his re-election pitch is to say, I'm, I'm the tough guy defending Turkish interest. And he's doing that by taking on a long-term battle, which is with, he would call uh, the Kurdish insurgency, what others would see as just simply Kurdish groups seeking rights within Turkey who have a Syrian affiliate. So this fight against uh, the Syrian Kurds is one where Erdogan in the past has launched ground offensives, such as 2019, to take territory in the northeast of the country. And what makes the threat different this time is two things. For the first time, Turkish uh, drone strikes have taken place near U.S. bases in northeast Syria. And the U.S. is a vital supporter of Kurdish groups in that area. And secondly, uh, Turkey is, has bombed Assad regime positions in northeast Syria as well. Do I think this means a Turkish invasion? Not necessarily, but I think Erdogan and the Turkish leadership are testing the reaction of the United States and of Russia. Will they stand up to us? And if the US and Russia don't stand up to at least these airstrikes, Erdogan may think he has a, an open space to push farther with ground operations. Yeah, and Russia is distracted. Always great to chat. Thanks so much. Thank you, Beth.